Hello and welcome to Murder Analyzed, I'm Christina Moore. Now the case today, we're going to look at the prime suspects in the Madeleine McCann disappearance. Now Madeleine disappeared on the 3rd of May 2007 from Playa de Luz in Portugal um, from apartment 5A. And so we're going to look at that very quickly because it's a very well-known case, but this case is more about Christian Brockner, the prime suspect in this case. Now I'll tell you now, <laughs> without even putting Madeleine McCann into this picture of this man. This case is very disturbing. This man's background is very disturbing. So again, with this video comes a warning because there is not only descriptions of children being abused sexually, physically, and probably mentally, psychologically. Also, Christian Brockner liked to film his crimes and as I said in many cases before, when we look at these sort of predators, and he is a predator, he's a psychopathic predator, and has been going for many years, that there is in, you know, stuff in this video, and the content of this video, is going to be disturbing to some people. We're going to deal with children, women, younger women, and we're also going to deal with older women older women up to the age of about 72, 73. This man is a predator. He's always been a predator. And this is what this case is about. So if you don't like this sort of information and you don't think you can handle this sort of information, switch off now. So Madeline McCann and her family, she had the two siblings, the two twins, 18 month old, two twins, uh, she was the oldest and she disappeared one day before her fourth birthday. Now the McCanns had already been in Portugal in the um, Ocean Club complex for about a week before she disappeared and for all that week the McCanns had left the children alone and gone to the restaurant within the complex of this Ocean Club and they had left um, a note really because they wanted the same table so they could make an easy access to go and check on the children. So they'd left, left a note in the um, reservation book to say that they needed this table and it was at the same time each night around eight o'clock that they would go with them and their friends for this meal. All of them leaving their children on their own in this complex. Um, and then they would go every half hour and check on them, take turns to check on these children. But what the McCanns had done has stated on this reservation that these children were on their own. We need this table because we've left the children on their own. That's um, one part of this case. But whether it's relevant, we'll see. So anyway, on the 3rd of May uh, 2007, Madeleine McCann disappeared from this complex in Playa de Luz in Portugal, apartment 5A. Um, Jerry and Kate McCann and other members of their group continued to check on the children. They went then to check on the child at around um, nine o'clock, 9.30 time I think it was, and um, Madeline was missing. Immediately, Kate McCann knew something was wrong. Um, this child doesn't get up and walk away. Plus the other two children were still fast asleep in the cot. So this is now I suppose where we should talk about Brockner because really there's never been any evidence in this case at all. It really hadn't. It, and there is a, you know, there was a lot of speculation that the McCanns had done it themselves. Um, you know, but I think when you haven't got any other evidence um, and this child just goes missing and it would literally without a trace people then do start to make up stories and stuff. And it's difficult really to with this case because she's been now missing a good few years. Even though I think um, there was prime suspects and I, I know well, I'm gonna call him Christian B for now, had been a prime suspect for about seven years, but no one really knew about it. Because the thing is when you have evidence, <laughs> unless you have evidence, you can't say it. So Kate then, rang the police 
players are these police. Now, this is a small community. This is a holiday sort of place. It's not a place where you're going to have major investigations going on regular. So really, to, to, to not slate the Portugal police, they really didn't have the expertise needed for this case. There was mistakes made in this case right from the offset. So when Kate then rang and got the police involved, and now we have three different police forces within this area now involved. We had the search dogs, this, that and the other coming in. The problem is, is when you have a crime scene in this country, in America, we have, you know, different things going on where we would know not to, you need to secure that crime scene. You need to make sure that there's no evidence lost in that crime scene. Now, because these police forces were what I would call in this country, country bumpkin police forces, not meaning that in any disrespect, but to, to not be the same as a major city police where they are highly trained in this sort of thing. They then did search the property for Madeleine McCann. They allowed search dogs in to that property within the first few hours of Madeleine McCann's disappearance. So therefore, the evidence that was there was already tainted. Because when you have search dogs now, and people, and lots of people, three different police forces now, going into this property, this, this apartment 5A, to look for evidence, before the crime scene team have got there and secured all the evidence first. So that all any, ev any evidence that would have been in this apartment was gone. So any fingerprints, any hair, anything else, was now <laughs> tainted by dog hairs, and that was mainly what they found, from the search dogs. And so this is why I always say with an investigation, especially when you have a missing child, is a crime scene should be the most secure place and the teams then should do their jobs within the forensic team first before then anybody else tramples through this property and destroying any evidence that may have been left. So that was probably the main reason why there was no evidence, scientific evidence, in this case. Because if there was, it was already tainted then by dog hairs and God knows what else. It would have been very difficult to find. Plus we are talking about 2007. Plus I think now, um, you know, DNA is, has got a lot better. But even, in, uh, even now, when you have destroyed a crime scene, through your lack of knowledge of, of how to run a case like this, that evidence then cannot come back in. Once it's been tainted, it can't be then admissible in court. You've, you've lost vital evidence and you've lost vital time within this. And I think this is the whole point about this case and why maybe the McCanns became suspects early on. And don't get me wrong, you know, parents are usually, when children go missing, of course they're the main suspects because they you have to have suspects and they, they were the main suspects and the Portugal police were right to question these people. You can't just think because they're doctors that you can trust what they're saying. And I think now as time's gone on and over the years and now we have more and more evidence, it is eliminated them from the inquiry. But at the time, I think the Portuguese police were right to question and do what they could because they were trying to solve this case. They weren't trying to solve it you know, I don't think they were trying to get, trying to do it personally to them, but they actually did believe that because there was no other evidence, the McCanns did this to their own child. That's now been proven that's not the case. So thank God for that, because now these people can get on with their lives. But at the time, I could understand why. So let's talk about this Christian B. A very, very dangerous, dangerous man. Christian B is a German national and he had already history from quite a young age. He was, first of all, I think we'll talk about because he was adopted and I don't know if that's got any consequence to it, but it, it sometimes seems that these people, that they feel that they've been um, rejected at birth, you know, for some reason or another. They, and even though the families that they've been adopted to have been good to them and um, he had quite a good life. His father was quite strict but it's known within this town that him and his siblings um, were quite bad. 
you know, they was well known in this town. Um, then I think when he was 14, when Christian B was 14, his father um, had a car accident and was paralysed then. And so the mother then had to take care of him. But by this time, the only people, that, the only person I think that was keeping Christian B under control, not that I think it would have ever stopped him, was the father. But once the father then became incapacitated, he could not no longer do that because he was you know, paralysed, he was, uh, you know, nearly died in this car accident. Christian B and his brothers then became a nightmare in this town and the mother could no longer handle him and also then um, put him in a home, um, really because she couldn't deal with him any longer. So again, another rejection for Christian B. But I think Christian B, when you look at his background and his early years, even the state of his, I mean, his crimes, I think, you know, he was born in, I think, 1976. But by the time in, in 1992, he was already arrested and he was already doing burglaries. Um, he had this, he was definitely a, a criminal from a very young age. And I think in 1995, um, when he was 18, um, he sort of began working then as a, you know, traveling as a backpacker and, and, I don't think his mother's actually seen him since uh, about 1994. She didn't have anything to do with him after that. She had to concentrate really, I think, on her own husband's uh, health. I don't think she, I think she knew something was wrong with him, but I think that's, it's stated in the papers and that at the moment that she's devastated in what's happened and she feels for the families because this man is so bad. But yeah, he was a backpacker and he, he um, uh, began working in a, in a catering and at seaside resorts. And that's how then he ended up in uh, Playa de Luz in, in Portugal in uh, 1995. So um, he was a prolific thief. He, he used to rob and he made a good living. I think it was 1994. Um, I think this is when the mother sort of disowned him. They'd had enough of him really. Um, and there was a sexual assault uh, in 1994 in Germany, in his hometown of Germany. And I'm not going to say all the names in German because I've got a terrible German accent. And, uh, you know, you know what I'm like with this London accent. It doesn't always come out. Um, but he was um, jailed, I think. He was, he, he was a, for abusing a child, but also performing acts in front of a child. Now he'd done this a lot later actually when he was in, and it's been suspect, he's in the suspect for, um, was under suspicion for many, many different crimes in, in Portugal, uh, this man. But in 1994 was really his first known crime where he spent 18 months in a youth uh, jail sentence for that. But um, then he's then, as I said, gone back packing and gone around, um, started working in catering, earning some money. Then he brought himself a VW camper van and he drove around in that and he he's by by 2005 um he's really started then i think the crimes that we now know about has come out i i can't see this man from 1994 to 2005 not doing any sexual offenses against children without a doubt there is many more out there and he's he's now being looked at for many more cases but again this man is innocent into all these are proven, um, you know, until he's proven guilty for them. But I think I can't, with someone like Christian B, this psychopath, sexual predator of vulnerable people, including children and women and elderly women, I can't see how this gap from 1994 <coughs> to 2005 happened. There was others in between. And I think that's really going to show as we look more into his personality and what he's done. So in 2005, he breaks in to an apartment in Playa de Luz. Now this is what he normally done anyway, was breaking in and done this. But I think actually, watch this woman. She was an American tourist and she was 72 year old. And he broke in and he tortured her. He raped her for several hours. He was there several hours and he filmed all of it because Christian B loves to keep an account of what he does. 
he likes to look back. Most of these serial killers, and probably that's what he is, and that will probably come out much more later in his trials as he goes through different things. And he's a serial offender of children. He's a serial rapist. This man is probably the worst man ever. He likes to film these things, to relive it. And the more you scream, and the more pain this man causes, is what that power that he gets from it. And so that's why he does it. Because don't forget, he hasn't got any empathy. So where we would scream and shout, and you're showing emotion, he can't see that emotion. To him, the only thing he's thinking of is about himself. Now this 72 year old, how she survived this attack, I do not know. Because it's one of the most vicious, perverted attacks that I've ever read. So I'm not going to go into a great detail because this woman really couldn't even tell her own friends for years about what happened to her. It was that bad. But it went on for a very, very long time and he filmed every part of it. So in 2007, he moved from his VW van that he was traveling around Playa de Luz and uh, Portugal in this this VW van and he moved into a farmhouse then, a little cottage, um, about a mile, mile and a half away from apartment 5A at the Ocean Club Plaza or complex. So he now lived a very short distance away from where Madeleine McCann was staying. That's one, I suppose, bit of evidence, but then there's a lot of people that would have lived a mile and a half away from this disappearance. He had been caught for burglary and he'd been caught for stuff around this time, um, why he was living in this cottage um, type thing out in mm -hmm. middle of nowhere. He'd been caught for burglary and he'd gone to court and the judge asked him that he could have got probation, but he said that he was a German national and therefore he didn't have any home to go back to. He didn't own any homes. He wasn't a resident of Portugal. Now, that was a lie. But he also, in that um, court case, they asked him, have you, have, have you got any other previous convictions? And he did say that he had a previous conviction in 1994 of sexually abusing and flashing himself and doing sexual acts to himself in front of children. So he, they knew now that he was now a child predator. But again, we're talking about this, uh, this part of Portugal, that it's not like England where we have sex offenders register and if you do something wrong, you go on a sex offender. So they didn't have any of that. So, that. so yes, he admitted it, but he didn't admit he had a property. Now the reason he didn't admit he had a property was because he had incriminating evidence in that property and he couldn't say he had a property or else they would have searched that property for stolen goods. Now it wasn't the stolen goods that he was worried about them finding. What he was worried about them finding was evidence, digital evidence, because the man likes to film what he does. Remember, that's what he does, films it for his own gratification later so he can relive it. He's no way did he want these police to find this. So he rang someone, an accomplice, you see, because he knows people, like-minded people, like Christian B, in Portugal, who removed all that incriminating evidence from that cottage a mile and a half away from Madeleine McCann. So this man has now done his 18 months there because he's not going to say. So this man is not stupid. He done the time rather than give himself up for other crimes because in the end that's what would have happened. They would have found this stuff. And now he's out. So now let's talk about the evidence now, what they have on, what the German police force now have on Christian B. Now as I said, Christian B has been a, 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 a one of the prime suspects in this case for about seven years. 
Jerry and Kate McCann um, done lots of TV interviews. They've tried to keep this case alive. And they'd done a TV interview in Germany. And there was 400 phone calls came in. And every one of them phone calls mentioned Christian B. And they, that people, that the police should be looking at Christian B in relationship, you know, to this case. So I think that's how long it's been. It was about seven years he's been a prime suspect. So when Madeleine McCann went missing, she went missing about half nine, ten o'clock. And what the Portugal police did, um, they wanted, because they had no other evidence, so you can imagine how many people are in this player de Luz and the phone calls that were going on. But what they done, they requested every phone call within that area, I think between 9 or 8.30 and 10.30 p.m. That's, that's a lot of data. When you're looking through evidence, that is so much data. It, it's, it, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. It's probably even harder than that. But it, it, it's so much data. But they tried. The Portugal police couldn't find anything. That evidence then, or that um, stuff was then, all this data was then given to uh, New Scotland Yard here in England, and they couldn't find anything. And it wasn't until it was given then to the German police that took absolutely years to go through this data, that they found a phone call. They found one phone call out of millions. And you can imagine, you know, we text and do all this, all that. to go through this sort of data, this, these police officers, you've got three now different countries that are now looking for some evidence on the disappearance of Madeleine McCann and it comes down to phone data. It, that's what it actually comes down to is that and how they found out then that Christian B was literally outside that apartment and he had took a phone call or made a phone call that took, it was on the phone for half an hour so that means he was either watching that apartment because Christian B, don't forget, is a thief, right? He's a burglar. He burglarizes his houses. He's a criminal. Apart from everything else he is, he's a thief. And that's how he makes his living. And that's how he buys all his stuff. He doesn't work. He hasn't got no sense of work. He's going to take what's yours. And his, his MO was to burgle first floor apartments. He never went much higher. Because really from a first floor you can jump out. From the second or third, you can't. So he always thought he was very good at what he'd done, and he always thought about the escape plan. He always had it planned. Now, apartment 5A was the first floor apartment on the corner. So typically, it was his sort of place to burglarize. Now, when we think about you have a predator like him going about, I, and then, that this is what I don't get. I think with Christian B, to have that much luck to burglarise a property without really knowing that these kids are in there alone. It's like winning the lottery, isn't it, for, for him? The probability of these children, of the, of the place that he's chosen to burgle, then would have three children left on their own in there and him have enough time to take them it's like winning the lottery for one of these paedophiles or predators i believe though what really went was going on is that when can uh, jerry and kate mccann left this note in this reservation book don't forget they'd been there a week they was on their second and last week they wrote <laughs> need this table at eight o'clock every night or half seven eight o'clock every night because we left, left our children on our own someone else now because we know he knows people and we know he knows like-minded people that like to abuse children i think there was two or more of, of these people and i think this was not an opportunist abduction or disappearance this was planned and I think it was planned because he knew then that these people, the McCanns, at the same time every night were going to sit at the same table so it's easy for them to watch. And I think the reason he was on the phone for that half an hour outside that property was because he was watching them 
and watching them coming back and forwards. And he knew exactly how much time he had to take that child. And that's exactly what happened, I think. Because we can't prove it yet, because there's no evidence. So for now, again, as I keep saying, Christian B is innocent until proven guilty. But if it was him, then this is what the German police are now thinking, the English police are now thinking, and the Portugal police are now thinking. Because it's just ironic, it's, it's, it's too much of a coincidence to have an apartment on its own, to have a child on its own, and then you have some child predator just turns up out of the blue and takes. He's been on the phone, and this phone call was made to Germany, and he was on the phone for 30 minutes outside apartment 5A in this ocean um, plaza com uh, com uh, complex. So at the time he had a camper van, a uh, V-Dub camper van again. He also drove a Jaguar car and you'll see these cars. Now I think the reason that the German police have now said things about making him the prime suspect in this case, and they're, they're, they're very honest about what they've said. They've said that they believe, or they have evidence now, that Madeleine McCann was murdered. Now, if we look at Christian B and his behaviour towards his victims, she probably didn't die that night. She would have been kept probably for two days, maybe. He would have kept her longer if he could. But I think what happened was the publicity was so big so anyone in their right mind, you know, wouldn't keep a child. But as I said, he's not in his right mind. Plus, two days after Madeleine McCann's murder, he deregistered his Jaguar car. It was took off the road, and then he left and went back to Germany. So, I, the Portugal police said they did look at him, but disregarded him as a suspect straight away. Plus, though, don't forget the Portugal police have absolutely destroyed any physical um, evidence, any evidence at all, actually. Any, uh, any incriminating evidence against anyone has been destroyed because you've literally allowed everybody into a crime scene before the forensic teams have actually done their stuff, done their job, and secured that scene. You've destroyed everything. You've had now three police forces within Portugal working on this, and they've died their best so far, but this case was ruined from the beginning by the Portugal police. And now I think the Portugal police are not so happy now that the German police have put out that Christian B is a prime sus a suspect in this, and that they have said that Christian B, uh, or they do know that, that Madeleine McCann is dead. Now there's a difference knowing that a child is dead so you might have evidence that proves that she's been murdered. But it's very difficult then to get the murderer or the evidence for the murderer. And this is why I think they've named Christian B as a suspect in this case. Because you need evidence. Now when we first looked at this in May 2007, there was no evidence. And it, everything was then, you know, you had 50-50 whether they, you know, the McCanns did it or someone else did it because of the lack of evidence. And that's all it was, lack of evidence. And also the Portugal police pushing this theory. And as I always say, in all these cases, theories don't solve crimes. Evidence does. So the police now know, the German police now know that yes, Madeleine McCann is dead. Or else they wouldn't have said it. There is no way that they would have made that statement unless they had evidence to support that later on down the line. But what they have said is they need more evidence to charge this man, Christian B, with her murder and others. So in the last, I suppose, few months, uh, probably last six months, maybe a year, the German police have found out that Christian B has many properties, <laughs> and uh, a couple of properties definitely in, in Germany, and he has this um, like a storage place, derelict sort of place, but it's a storage sort of place in Germany, in the middle of nowhere, 
and they found out that he owned this, this property. So they've done searches on this property and the things they found in this property, and remember I keep saying to you, he likes this data, he likes to film things, he likes, you know, to relive, to go, a lot of, a lot of them do like to relive it, so a lot of people will take, you know, stuff off the victims, but I suppose for people like him, to film it is probably the, it's like doing it again, isn't it? And so I think when they um, search this building, and they they found lots of computers, lots of different stuff in there. Um, and they started digging up places and they found buried under his dog um, about six to eight thousand pieces of um, data. So that could be filming, that could be stuff off the computer, that could be a lot of stuff, but there was eight, around eight thousand different items of data relating to different crimes. And there was a young girl as well, I think, um, gone missing this, around this time um, in Germany. And he's suspect on that. He's suspect on uh, another um, young boy going missing in Player Deluge. There's a lot that this man is suspect for in this um, thing. And I think what they're doing is, you know, when we talk about data and you're trying to then go through evidence of data, thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces of data. Now one piece of data, because it was about 8,000, could be a video that's an hour long, or it could be a video that's five hours long. You don't know with him. So this is what's taking the time to go through all the evidence on Christian B and the multiple cases that they think he's done. At the moment, he hasn't been charged with anything or questioned with anything to do with Madeline McCann. Now there's reasons for that, because this data they've got they need to go through all of it. So yes, they know he was in Player Deleuze at the time. They knew he was on the phone outside apartment 5A on a phone to someone in Germany. They probably feel and um, assume that he is the murderer, which they do, but now they have to prove it. And this evidence that they feel they've got in here may, yes, it's probably shown that she was murdered, but it hasn't shown who's done it. He's not that silly. So this data has now got to go through. But this man is also on other charges because there was other rapes at the time in Player Deluge. And people now, since his photo has been put out there as this main suspect, and that's done for a reason, because at the time when you have no evidence and you have no, you know, people haven't got, people need to jog their memory. And a photograph or something that's happened there may have jogged your memory. Did you see him? Did you do this? And so that's why they've done it. As always, these people don't always work alone. You know, very rare do um, sexual predators of children work alone. And especially in a case like this, where you would have either had to, I've got this child out of Portugal, which to tell you the truth, I don't think, I think she died in Portugal without a doubt, because I think that's what he had to do, even though I think he would have wanted to take her it was a bit of a risk taker though him, I, I think, so you, you can't even, you can't say he didn't. You can't say he didn't put her in the back of this camper van and drive her across to Germany. You just don't know. But I think, you know, it, you're assume, I'm assuming things and, and really we shouldn't assume. But I think this child could be buried anywhere between Portugal and Germany. Anything could have happened to this child. But somebody else knows. Somebody else knows. And as this case gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and the more evidence against him with other crimes that he's committed, as well as Madeleine McCann come out, I think more people may come forward with stories. Because this man, Christian B, did have girlfriends, young, and he was very violent to them as well, who may know something. But this man, as when we've with most of these people, especially this psychopath like him, is very violent very dangerous and he just keeps let, being let out of prison. Now he's up again, I think in January uh, 2021, um, because he's appealed the case, a drug deal case, um, he's appealed. And I think what the police are doing is trying to keep this man in prison. I think he got seven years for the rape of the American tourist. But again, you, as you, we've said before about these sentences, you may get seven years, but you ain't doing seven years. So this man saying, 
will be out unless they get other evidence against him that can prove that not only has he done the Madeleine McCann murder, but he's done other murders of children in Germany and in, and in Player de Luz, which they, they do believe he has done, but they have to have evidence. If there is no evidence, this man will be released because a court of law doesn't rely on what you think may happen or what you've assumed happened. The court of law will only rely on the evidence clear evidence that you can prove. So this case is far from over. This case is unsolved still, the Madeleine McCann case, plus the other cases that this they are looking into. But this case will remain unsolved until somebody or some other evidence that proves that he, yes, they may know that Madeleine McCann is dead, but they don't know who done it. Or they can't prove who done it and until they can do that this man could be out 2021 2022 he's out again and I think this is why they're holding back a lot of evidence so yes they've released out that she's dead they've released out that he's the prime suspect because they want to generate people's thoughts on do you know anything else is there any one little bit of evidence that could convict this man of this crime? It gives them time to go through the data that they found to try and get him on other crimes. So this case is a very strange case, but it's far from over. And I'll probably be back again next year doing the next part of this case. You have, um, I mean, he has a defense team, Christian B and his defence seems do say that they have evidence that can prove that he didn't do this. Well, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But as again, I said to you, this man has not been questioned yet about Madeleine McCann. They're saving it. They're saving it. They want this man. They know he done it. Now they've just got to prove it. So, okay, let's go through the facts. And so Madeleine McCann disappeared on the 3rd of May 2007 from apartment 5, a uh, on this ocean um, complex uh, uh, and Christian B lived about one and a half miles from there he now we now know that he was in this area or outside of this apartment 5a on the phone for 30 minutes on the night of Madeleine McCann's disappearance and that's really all we know we also know that the police um, in Germany and the prosecutor in Germany has said that they have evidence that Madeleine McCann was murdered. But they don't have enough evidence to charge Christian B with her murder yet. They're also now looking at the easier cases to get him on and the evidence that they are compiling against him to keep this man in prison. So really, this has been Christian B, the prime suspect in Madeleine McCann's disappearance. And I really hope that this case will be solved one way or the other. But I can't emphasize enough that the moment Christian B is innocent until proven guilty. All I'm doing on here is telling you the facts and his background. But, <laughs> I think if this man is released, we should all be careful, no matter what country you live in. So this has been the case of Christian B. I hope you've uh, found this case interesting. Keep a watch out in the news. And my um, information was date updated, I think I updated it on the 4th of December, 2020. So, so far, so until January, when I probably update this again, this is as far as we've got with this case for now. So thank you for watching. You know what to do. Hit that like button, you know, thumbs up button. Hit that subscribe button that Lacey puts up there. Um, you can follow us on Facebook and on Instagram. And until the next time, bye-bye.